Uh, continuing a discussion on efforts to address climate change, we now invite Ms. Jennifer Gomez Molina, who co chairs the Offshore Renewable SIG. Uh, Jennifer will be presenting on the rise of offshore renewable technologies, considering the survivability of these options given relative independence of the energy supply. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to provide an overview of the UK's offshore renewable energy industry and how it can secure our energy future, respond to the climate energy challenge, and also play its role in shaping our sustainable blue economy. Now, I stand here having joined IMRS as a student, and after time in uh, subsea engineering and hydropower, I'm delighted to be invited to start contributing back uh, to our technical program. The growth of the world population and our modern energy intensive lifestyle has led to an increase in the demand for our energy resources. In the UK alone, the average rate of energy use has increased from 0.5 to 2 kilowatts per capita. In order to meet this demand effectively, we are faced with an energy trilemma. Energy security, environmental sustainability and energy equity but I believe renewables can definitely meet this challenge. Energy supplies need to be uninterrupted and free from any political instability, diverse and where possible indigenous so that we can ensure that our energy needs are met effectively and securely. We must also reduce our reliance on carbon emitting energy generation and improve the environmental footprint of the sector. But what is the point? What is the point if we can't afford to use the energy generated? We must ensure that energy generation is accessible to all and also affordable, whether it be through energy bills or the upfront costs to develop, build and operate schemes. It's clear that there's a growing interest in renewables, especially offshore renewables. The latest Bayes Energy and Climate Change Public Attitudes Tracker shows a record 85% of public expressed support for renewable energy, with offshore wind at the highest recorded level of 83% and wave and tidal energy at 76%. Makes a change from uh, not in my own backyard. In addition, up to two thirds of people said they would be happy to have a large renewable energy scheme in their area. The private sector is taking these greening attitudes on board by adopting sustainability as a core component of their business strategy. In 2017, the total energy output from the investments that LEGO had made in renewables, which equal 546 gigawatt hours, was greater than the energy they consumed at all their factories, offices and stores. This includes a 25% stake at the Burbo Bank Extension wind farm, which is located off the coast of Liverpool, and that generates enough power for 230,000 homes. IKEA are also investing in offshore wind in order to meet their 2020 target uh, of renewable investments exceeding their energy consumption. Not only does this appeal to the consumers, but it also secures their energy supply, enhances their economic performance, and also achieves their climate change ambitions. But how did we get here? The oceans absorb up to 90% of the heat emitted from greenhouse gases, so, we, so it is used as a measure for global warming. I'm sad to report, and it does make me a little emotionally unstable, that the last five years have had the hottest ocean temperatures on record. 25% of these anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions in the last 40 years has been attributed to the energy sector. This has to change or we'll be faced, if we're not already, with sea level rise, the displacement of coastal communities, an increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, and in addition, the adverse effects to ocean biodiversity. Trade organizations were set up to act as a collective voice of the industry to secure the best legislative and regulatory framework for promoting renewable energy in the UK. Renewable UK, or the British Wind Energy Association, as it was known in 1978 when it was started, uh, promoted wind power in the UK, starting with onshore wind first. Then this expanded with the growth of offshore wind, 
in 2004 and in also Encompass Wave and Tidal Energy and it was rebranded as Renewables UK in 2009. There is also the Renewable Energy Association which was established in 2001 and this encompasses all sectors of the clean tech arena and they have an ocean energy group promoting the interests of re marine renewables. Together, Renewables UK and the Renewable Energy Association has supported the growth of the industry by lobbying for government support in subsidies, providing market intelligence, uh, fostering collaboration and providing training. This is so important in order for our sector to progress forward. The government has also responded to this challenge. A renewable energy delivery program has been in place since 1990 and with the 2008 Climate Change Act formalising how we will respond to climate change. This has a target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 80% in comparison to 1990 levels. After 10 years, we have met the first two carbon budgets and we are on track to meet the third. Today, the UK offshore renewable sector is made up of four subsectors. There is offshore wind, which generates power by placing mounted turbines in areas of high wind speed. To date, there are 37 offshore wind farms operating in the UK, with more in the planning and consenting process, and there are further sites to be developed. There is wave energy, which uses kinetic energy from the vertical motion of surface waves. There is 137 megawatts of wave energy projects in the UK. We also have tidal stream, which generates energy from turbines located in tidal currents. These turbines can either be floating with moorings or fixed to the seabed. And then there is tidal range. This exploits the vertical difference between high and low tide across an impounded area by placing turbines in between and discharging flow through. How did it begin? Well, it started with the Blythe Offshore Wind Farm, and this was the first wind array to be installed in the UK. It was located in the North Sea off the coast of Northumberland, and its two, two megawatt Vestas turbines could generate enough energy to power 3,000 homes. Wave energy was kick-started by the Palamis Wave Energy Converter, and this was the first to generate electricity uh, and link it to the national grid. This, is located at the, this was located at the European Marine Energy Center in Orkney. Tidal Stream was kick-started by the Marine Current Turbine C-Gen device, which was a large-scale tidal stream generator. The 1.2 megawatt device was installed in the Strangford Loch in Northern Ireland. But what about tidal range? Well, this is yet to get off the ground. But the fact that the UK has the second largest tidal range in the world, uh, second to the Bay of Fundy in Canada, and 50% of Europe's tidal resource, well, I think the future is promising. There have been numerous attempts to develop a scheme in the Severn, which, as you can see from the map, is where the greatest resource is in the UK. But it has been stored by issues with costs and environmental concern. You may or may not have heard in the news uh, that Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon was previously rejected by ministers for government subsidies on the basis of the unit cost of electricity being too high. Uh, this is especially in comparison to offshore wind and nuclear. But it's had a new lease of life. Tidal Lagoon Power are in discussions with several organisations interested in buying the low carbon electricity through power purchase agreements. If this is realised, this will be the first UK power station funded by the private sector. Watch this space. I think this is very exciting. So, this is the current state of play where we are in the UK now and the sources of where our energy comes from. Coal is currently mostly imported from abroad. The natural gas is still popular as it has uh, a lower carbon levy. Nuclear is still in the mix, but we're not sure for how long, as sites are being decommissioned and there is uncertainty with new builds. Renewables is on the rise, and we can see a shift from conventional fossil fuels to more sustainable uh, energy alternatives. In 2017, power generated from offshore wind reduced the carbon emissions by over 9.6 million tonnes. It is now expected to generate 10% of the UK power needs by 2020. 
But these achievements are not without their challenges. There is a high level of competition for sea space and rights to generate electricity are managed by the Crown Estate. The Henry Review, which assessed the strategic case for tidal lagoons in the UK, concluded that companies should compete for government support to build lagoons. Renewables are known for their intermittent generation and peak generation doesn't always match peak demand. And there are also challenges with power surges and fluctuations. It has been discussed that this could be combated by adopting a European cross-border electricity network where we could share any surplus energy. But this will have collaboration and pricing and security and transmission loss uh, losses which could pose further challenges. And then there are the environmental challenges to surmount. Projects must demonstrate compliance with conservation legislation and their commitment to minimizing impact on marine habitats, species and the coastal landscape. Uh, not only through design, the inherent design, but through commissioning and operation. Stakeholders and regulators are working with developers in the industry to share data and guidance and exchange good practice. But mostly, early engagement really, really helps. Sitting around the table and just having it out and getting all the issues out and sorted. And from there, uh, good progress is made. But these challenges can be overcome if the financial support is in place. And this is evidenced by the offshore wind sector. The levelised cost of energy, so the cost of electricity production over the lifetime of the scheme, has reduced from £135 per megawatt hour in 2011 to £57 per megawatt hour in 2017. The financials of the tidal and wave projects are more complex, uh, showing a levelised cost of energy at £300 per megawatt hour. There's still a way to go for tidal and wave devices to be competitive with the established offshore wind sector. But pioneering projects have paved the way for the industry and here I will focus on uh, tidal devices. So we have Symec Atlantis Energy and in 2014 they signed a power purchase agreement with Smartest Energy for power generation for the first phase of their tidal stream major project. This enabled them to secure long-term investment until 2025 um, in the region of 51 million pounds. Now this is great for a developer because it gives them security of income coming in throughout the lifetime of the project and gives them the, the freedom to showcase the technical viability of what they are doing. Um, and we have Nova Innovation, so a community group in Wales um, has been working with the CCAMS project in collaboration with Bangor and Swansea University to quantify and uh, understand how to extract the tidal resource from the Bard Sea Sound in North Wales. Uh, NOVA has been collaborating too to see if they can adopt, uh, well, incorporate their 100 kilowatt turbine array there and explore the feasibility of realizing this scheme. So it's good to start off small because you can learn from your experience and issues which would be more costly at a larger scale. Then we have Monesto. Monesto has their deep green uh, technology which exploits a special niche in the market. So it operates with flows up to 2.4 meters per second which is not conventionally used for tidal stream devices because it's considered a bit low but they've been quite innovative and uh, generated a device that can exploit this, this area um, of the market. So currently they, have a, they had a 0.5 megawatt demonstrator in the Holyhead Deep um, and they have plans to increase the install capacity and then convert that into a full tidal array for the future. So this is exciting and um, recent news shows that they are showcasing and exporting their, their technology overseas. But we can't stop here. We need to do more. In my head, I always think, go hard or go home. We need to do more for renewables. And it's with projects like these that has helped us realize that. Uh, 
are the drivers to help the renewable, uh, offshore renewable uh, sector has been the existing marine supply chain. So the development services, the offshore operations and the bespoke engineering, we can all learn from these techniques and existing processes. Then there are the testing facilities which enable um, developers to test uh, their designs and improve their performance and efficiencies. But in addition to this, uh, the European Marine Energy Centre and the Wave Hub, which is based in Cornwall, um, also support developers by providing wider services such as the health and safety associated with schemes, uh, data analysis and monitoring, um, and all of this helps to contribute to bring a technology to commercialisation. As I mentioned before, academic and industry collaboration is key because this way we can really accelerate the deployment of uh, these innovative devices. There's the Renewable Energy Marine Structures Center of Doctoral Training and also the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult, um, which kind of facilitates this process and uh, set up, set, sets up collaboration events and networks. But not only does this help promote the sector technically, also in the aspect of skills. So we're helping students and um, doctoral students prepare with the appropriate skills and experience so that they're ready to hit the ground running when they enter the sector. But we cannot lose sight of the cost of energy. We need to work together to find cost savings through design, development, procurement, operation and maintenance in order to reduce the cost of the installed capacity of these schemes. I don't want to sound high maintenance but we need lots of things to support our industry going forward. Um, not only through uh, more funding, uh, whether it be through schemes or funding research, um, such as the recent offshore wind sector deal, which the government has provided to grow services and products for export, but also access to facilities. We need to be able to export our technologies, our services, our products, our supply chain, if we really want to secure ourselves as a world leader in this growing economy. Also knowledge transfer from established sectors. I know from my background, tapping into great minds from other sectors has been really useful because with the oil and gas industry and the maritime sector, there's so much work already gone into building engineering and technology solutions in harsh marine environments. And we can learn this for offshore renewables. There are many processes, designs, approaches that can be applied and adopted, and this will lead to time and cost savings. The de decommissioning of oil and gas assets should be seen as an opportunity um, so that we can repurpose it for renewables. This could include vessels or offshore structures. Why waste? Let's, let's reuse these assets and get them up and running. Lastly, we need a unified approach to the environmental monitoring and assessment um, of permitting and consents. This is always a challenge. Everyone always has a range of opinions, but we need to work together because we all have the same end goal and, um, and it's time to act and move forward. Um, and I know from experience that Scottish Natural Heritage and Marine Scotland and also um, Wales um, and the Environment Agency um, have been really helpful in providing guidance and working with the sector to convey as much as possible what are the needs, what are the requirements, what are the objectives that need to be met in order to uh, re receive these permits and consents. Offshore renewables plays an integral role in achieving our sustainable blue economy. It's through collaboration and innovation um, and support from the existing marine industries that we can achieve this progress. With our rich history in the maritime sector and a multidisciplinary approach to developing and managing marine resources and activities, we at IMRS are playing our part in the green energy revolution. This is not only by our representation on the uh, International Panel for Climate Change, but our latest climate change position statement showcases how we are going to support government policies for renewable energies. In our offshore renewable special interest group, we are doing our bit to support IMRS in these initiatives, and we're also doing our bit to help entrance into the industry with our academic outreach program, working with the CEO Future uh, team, 
and also showcasing news and developments with our corresponding members. We do encourage you to get in contact. We do have plans, myself and my fellow co-chair Alice Goward brown to um, reach out to our members and try and get more activity going. I for one am really proud and I feel really fulfilled to be part of this sector. Not only does it address a climate change crisis and helps humanity, but also there's so much, so many new things happening all the time and it just gives you an, the opportunity to grow and better yourself as a person. So let's continue to do all this great work together. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, thank you very much. Some great examples there of uh, how we can tackle some of the problems that, that Tristan talked about, perhaps. Uh, we do have time for a couple of questions, so I'll, I'll hand you over to Bev and see what we have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so our first question is around uh, the UK support for renewables, um, given the issues with Swansea Bay and the Seven Barrage. Um, is there enough support for renewables from the government and sufficient investment in order to uh, make the most out of our amazing resource and technologies? Uh, hmm. Yes, there is. Um, but sometimes the eligibility criteria to apply for these are quite strict on location um, and sort of the size of company that you are. And also, there's always a gap between getting so far on the R&D line, getting through prototyping and then commercial demonstrator, and then making that final leap into commercialization. So uh, further support is needed there. I know Innovate UK are doing wonderful things and uh, the Welsh Government and uh, the Scottish Government are doing uh, are launching prize, prize funds to help uh, drive this uh, innovation forward. Um, more can be done but there, there is a lot that exists and it's a matter of making sure that everyone knows about these opportunities. Um, the next question is, does taking the energy out of the ocean cause any other side effects that we should be aware of? <laughs> well, there's always the environmental aspect with regards to uh, sort of the, uh, the species and habitats that live there. And it's a matter of, that's, that's why monitoring is so important and sharing data so that you can ensure that through the design and operation of your scheme that you're not impacting the ocean environment you'll never be a truly green energy if you're if you're not addressing these issues i think related and a final question is should the offshore renewables sector target a complete zero em emission approach for their developments going forwards Ooh. <laughs> hmm. I, well as i said before I, you could go hard or go home I think this is such an exciting sector and it's so, I think everyone's so motivated because there is no planet B. We have to go, we have to do the best that we can and um, this is really cheesy but I always think if you aim for the moon and you miss it, at least you fall among the stars. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Jen Jennifer, we love cheese. That, that, what a fantastic way to finish. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed.